Welcome to Comics TV, we're your weekly guide to the comic book universe. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Rizzo, and today I have a special guest with me, the leader of East of Idaho, Gilbert Neal. Hi. Steve is on vacation, so Gil's filling in today. So we're going to kick our show off right away with the comics news. Topping this week's comics news, only twice in its history has Skybox commissioned one artist to provide all of the original artwork for a series of trading cards. The, result. the results speak for themselves, as Jim Lee's X-Men and Joe Jusco's Marvel Masterpieces from 1992 both rank among the most successful comic card lines to ever hit the market. Skybox announced on May 13, 1994, that it has commissioned one of the best-known painters in the industry, Dave Dorman, to provide 100% of the artwork for an extraordinary new card series, Skybox Master Series, Ultraverse Edition. Dorman, who won the 1993 Eisner Award as the best comics painter, is creating 96 all-new original paintings of the top characters from the Ultraverse for this card line. The August releasing card series will include 90 regular cards as well as several groundbreaking moments in the popular Ultraverse storyline. Vertigo creators and titles led by Sandman and Hellblazer dominate the nominations for the 1993 Will Eisner Comic Industry Awards. The nominees were selected by a five-person judging panel that considered hundreds of publisher submissions as well as numerous unsubmitted comics. Eligible items had to have been shipped to comic shops between January 1st and December 21st, 1993. DC Comics, including Vertigo, snagged 32 nominations. The next closest publisher was Dark Horse with 11. Marvel received its most nominations ever, due primarily to Marvel's, with a total of 10, as did Kitchen Sink. Fanagraphics received 8, Aardvark Van Hein, publisher of Cerebus, had seven, and Cartoon Books, publisher of Bone, received four. Image Comics had four this year, and Bongo, Gladstone, Drawn and Quarterly, Rubber Blanket Press, Tops, Last Gasp, NBM, Palliard, Mirage, and Slave Labor all received one nomination. Ballots are being mailed to 5,000 industry people. The winners will be announced at a gala award ceremony at the San Diego Comic Convention on August 4th. Comics industry luminary Jim Shooter and Super Bowl legend Frank O'Harris, both Pittsburgh hometown heroes, announced May 11th the formation of a partnership with the Pittsburgh Police Department to help get unregistered guns off the streets. The event was to take place on Saturday, May 21st at Eider Entertainment in Pittsburgh. Each gun surrendered was to get the bearer a Harris autographed football and the latest five issues of The Good Guys autographed by Shooter. Much to Dark Horse's pleasure, the Eisner Award nominations have been released. We have nominees in 10 categories, said David Scroggy, Vice President of Publishing, with two nominees in one of the categories. To receive the recognition which we have with this year's Eisner Awards nominations is truly an honor, commented Mike Richardson, the publisher. Not a metaphor in the world could aptly describe how proud I am to have my name associated with that of Will Eisner. Dark Horse nominations include Best Letterer, Todd Klein, and Best Painter, Teddy Christensen. My first review is a book called Nurture the Devil, Jeff Johnson's Nurture the Devil. It's issue one, published by Fantagraphics Books, and it's written by Jeff Johnson. Whole bunch of artists, whole bunch of inkers, costs $2.50. 
The story goes something like this. The main story, which is entitled The Garden, deals with a family dominated by... Please don't touch me. <laughs> with a family dominated sadistically by the elder sister since the mother died. The sister, Lily, browbeats the father into punishing the two younger brothers via torture, humiliation, and whatnot. Lily's friends are, let's say, open-minded sexually, and the entire episode, this is part one, there is a threat of part two, <laughs> is riddled with bizarre references to incest, masochism, and sexual imagery. I thought the story was good. Uh, the dialogue was good reading. It was a very good read. Uh, the art is avant-garde. It looks kind of like a sketchy uh, elementary school type thing, but I happen to like that. It's pretty good. I was very interested. It, was, it held your attention, at least the first story did. Um, I'll get it more into the other ones later. Uh, the action level is really irrelevant since most of the action takes place in um, the bordello that they call a house. <laughs> it was very real. You know, if you've been in therapy, you know that. Uh, the humor, there was no humor. There was no color. It was only black and white. Hence the term black and white. The target audience has got to be adults because this, this has got a lot of nasty stuff in it. And um, most of it's stranger than a blonde Chinaman. But the overall grade I thought was very, very good. I enjoyed it. And there's also... Um, the main story was very, very good. I enjoyed it, although you have to read into it, sort of. Um, there's a short story afterwards. It's called The Babies, and it's just undescribable. It's only like about three or four pages, but I can't begin to describe it to you. But get it. It's um, pretty good, and you'll enjoy it. But I hope if you're over 18, you'll like it a lot. If not, then your parents will smack you around a little bit. So. <laughs> uh, my second review. Hmm, this week. This week. <laughs> this week. Each and every week. Um, this is <laughs> titled, titled Vicious. Um, this is a book called Vicious. It's the Platinum Edition. Uh, it's issue one. Its um, publisher is Kurt Lindo, who also did a lot of work on the art and stuff like that, and he wrote some of the stories too. Cost three ninety five, and uh, the story goes like this: It's three stories about futuristic Avengers. Seems to be the common theme. The headhunter deals with a female executive type who also doubles and is an infiltrator of foreign espionage, as well as a um, very good assassin. Jugular Vein concerns a radio talk show host who also happens to be Death. Um, quite the stud, Death. Blood Hunter deals with a vampire hunter in a violent battle with a thug hired probably by the vampire union to kill him. The stories were pretty good. The dialogue was all right. The art was good. Uh, the interest level was poor to good. Um, can't say that I really liked it that much. Action was very, very violent. Uh, the realism, there was none, of course. Um, the humor was none, except for Blood Hunter, which is the last story. It includes some of those... Uh, Clint Eastwood type um, fun lines after you smack somebody in the head and say something witty. Um, target audience has got to be uh, nerds, basically. <laughs> um, fairly boring romp through another college graduate's fantasies. I didn't like this book very much at all. Um, I didn't like the violence, although I'm sure that there are some people out there who will, but I thought it was too violent for me. So that's all I have to say about it. My first book today is Through the Habit Trails. It's a trade paperback from Bad Habit, which is Jeff Nicholson's production. He is the publisher. He does all the artwork, all the story on here. The only thing he doesn't do is he didn't do part of the lettering. It's $9.95, and it's very interesting. It's a 144-page collection of stories on the workplace, marriage, and the escape series which was nominated for a 1993 Eisner Award, which we've been saying a lot tonight. This, overall, I give the entire thing very good. The art, the story, the dialogue, realism, the humor. It's a black and white book. It's a lot of reading. It's not one of these quick ones that you can just flip through and read in five minutes. There's a lot of reading in this 144 pages, which is the basis for the whole thing. You have to read. There's pictures, but it's more like a novel with pictures, even though it's a whole comic book. Um, it's a unique look at the world. It took me a while to get through it, but I found it extremely interesting, and it's definitely worth every penny. Pick this one up if you're an adult. Uh, yeah, if you're an adult, because there is some mature situations in this book. My second book today is called Grateful Dead Comics. This was one I did not want to review <laughs> because I hate the Grateful Dead. But I reviewed it because there are Grateful Dead fans out there, and unfortunately, there are a lot of them. 
It's uh, volume two, number two, published by Kitchen Sink Comics, it, written by various people, in, including Timothy Truman, an artist, but well, I don't know, he didn't write that, but he did some artwork, and uh, if you know Timothy Truman, he does some very good art. Cost is three ninety five. These are Grateful Dead stories. That's all it is. There's a story from Monterey Pop. There's uh, some other stories in here, written by other people, and it's it's not a bad book overall. Um, the artwork's good, the colors good, uh, the story. I, I suppose the stories are okay. If you're a Grateful Dead fan, they're probably fantastic. It's um, definitely for Grateful Dead fans only, though. That's the only people I would think that would like this. The first story was okay. It's a tale about Monterey Pop in 1967. Second story is by Terry Labar of Cud. Uh, he writes a pretty good story. The last story is an interpretation of Eagle Mall. It's a, one of their songs. And it's overall not, not a bad book. I personally would never read it again, but it's not a bad book. All right, since um, we don't have a dual review this week, we're going to talk a little bit with our guest, our guest host today, uh, Gil. So um, tell us a little bit about your band, since that has nothing to do with the show. Tell us a little <coughs> bit about East of Idaho. Okay, well, East of Idaho is a country band, and we play all over the place. Um, mostly lately the southern tier, but we're also um, engaged to play a lot of places in the city. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, places like Howie's and the Alamo and um, Desperados and... Uh, private clubs and parties and things. We're even, we're even doing a wedding in the fall. That's going to be very strange. I um, uh, feel sorry for those people. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we're playing all around and we just got a CD done and we're going to be releasing it probably in August sometime. We'll have a big release party. Let you viewers know where it is. And um, that's about all we're doing. We're very, very, very busy. So how long have you been collecting comics? I've been collecting comics for about nine years now. I got interested in it... Um, as a sort of a side hobby, I mean, I had a lot of free time on my hands. I wasn't really working, and collecting cans doesn't really provide much of an income anymore. <laughs> so I uh, started buying some comic books, you know, Swank Reader, things like that, Penthouse, you know, those comic books. And then I started getting into the kind of people actually draw, which is crazy. I mean, people draw these things. That's nutty. But, um, no, about nine years I've been getting into it. Um, my favorites are the ones that... Uh, aren't, uh, as you can tell, don't involve a whole lot of violence or fantasies. I'm more of a someone who gets into biography and, and nonfiction. So, okay. um, Gil was involved uh, somewhat in the creation of our Comics TV theme, uh, so why don't you give us a little background on uh, your involvement in it? Uh, yeah, the guy who wrote um, the thing, uh, Dave Snyder, was uh, living in the same house as I was, and um, he asked me if if um, if I wanted to do some singing on it, and I said sure, as I am want to do since I am uh, a exhibitionist. <laughs> um, so he asked me to do it, and the only part that you'll hear on the thing that I sing is the part that goes Comics TV. That's the only part that I sing. <laughs> Everything else is other people. So, but, but he needed some class in there, so I did you know that. To and uh, give us Gil, some class. Gil's name is in the credits. Uh, it wasn't for a while. We, <laughs> we had some contractual problems, but uh, once we straightened that out, my record company released my name. Yes. <laughs> We got his name into the credits, and he's felt better ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I, be I believe that's uh, that's about it for for now. And we will go in. Uh, well, actually, as long as we're sitting here, <laughs> we have this uh, classified document here. Gee, which, funny how you had that. Yes, yeah, uh, it was a classified document that came from Image Comics. Uh, we will show that's in our, uh, our our little. Pictures here. We're going to show you some of the stuff. This is. That's my sister. Yes, it is. Okay. This is um, Wetworks from Image Comics Wildstorm Productions. This has been, from what I understand, uh, on hold for about two years. And uh, Wheels Portacio has finally, finally got it together. This will be arriving in July. The first issue will be coming out. The first three issues are completely penciled. The first one is completely inked by now. The second one might be completely inked. This book is going to arrive on time every month. This could be one of the hottest selling books of the summer because we're going July, August, September. Um, yep, and that's it. The three issues. As of right now, it's just a mini series. 
after that, if, if the sales go like they hope that they're going to go, it will definitely be a uh, continuing series. Uh, the only problem is, uh, hopefully they're going to keep it timely since they seem to have that problem, uh, keeping it, keeping all their books coming out on time. And since these will be done, who knows if they'll have enough to keep it. They might actually take a, a leave of absence to, in order to get the series rolling. But uh, from all looks this looks like a fantastic storyline it really looks like one of the better image stories this is it involves vampires which is nothing like image does there vampires and wet works and uh the thing let's see the first one ships july 5th which is just in less than a month now second one august 2nd and the last one september 6th that's projected and as of right now it looks like they're going to go uh, a little background on on wills he did pencils on some Punisher, Legion of the Night, X Factor from number 63 to 69. He did on Uncanny X Men 281 to 290, and Wet Works. He's done inks on. He did inks on Lawn Shot number one through six, which was a, I believe that was just a mini series from Marvel. He did some Alien Legion inks and Alpha Flight inks for about 20 issues. So he's got some some experience, and that's the that. <coughs> Okay, this is the small press review. My first book is called Futuro Tierra. It's number 20 by Tony Lorenz. The story continues after the shipwreck. It's not a bad and it's only 50 cents. Second book is called Zeno's Era or Arrow. It's number two. It's from a guest to comics in Ontario, Canada. The story heats up as an escape is planned. Great story and art. It's a dollar fifty. And my third and last one is called Rough Cut Number One. It's the Ashcan edition. It's a new book from a new company called Rough Cut Productions. Victor and Fracture has image look to it. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for these books because it's not too bad. That's it for a small press this week. Welcome once again to that infamous feature, Classic Comics. We present for your enjoyment and quest for knowledge, Mutt and Jeff number one, which was not numbered actually, but it was number one, the summer of 1939 from DC Comics. This one shot represented a significant departure for DC. Formerly, they had avoided the reprint title, preferring to develop their own original characters. The title was obviously a test to see if the market would support an entire book devoted to a single character or characters, as in this case. This book has the honor of being the very first newsstand comic devoted to a single reprint strip. After a very slow start for issue in four years, Mutt and Jeff was made a quarterly and soon became a popular run lasting 24 years. It was the only successful reprint series of a single character to enjoy a respectable run. The syndicated Mutt and Jeff strip was, after the Cats and Jama Kids, the oldest continuously published newspaper strip. The first issue in good condition is worth $108. In near mint condition, Martin Jeff number one is worth around $650. That's it for this week, kids. Secret Weapons is so top secret, I'm afraid Bob Layton may come in here and shoot me if I say too much about it. But uh, I have seen the character designs for it that uh, George has come up with. The characters are very, very exciting. This should be a number one issue. It's number 11, so it's a double one, and it's twice as much fun as a regular number one comic book. Nobody's ever going to see it. Nobody out there, other than anybody here in the Valiant offices, are going to see this until the day that book ships and goes into the comic stores. Nobody is going to see who those new characters 
characters are. So the day it ships, make sure you're in there, pick up that copy, crack open the envelope, and take a look at some of the most exciting new characters that have ever come out of Valiant. What is Valiant? Uh, it's kind of a wayward home for storytellers. Valiant is a team effort. Valiant, to me, is the uh, essence of what comic books should be. doesn't follow trends per se, but we try to set, you know, the pace, I think, uh, in terms of what comics are really about, uh, a blend of, of literature and art, you know, to, uh, to form a unique medium. I think some people have forgotten that, you know, and it's like I think Valiant is a constant reminder to people, especially people who are serious storytellers, that there's a place where they can come and tell, tell good stories, you know, and uh, practice their and improve their craft. People say, well, Valiant has a house style. Well, it's not really a house style. When you take a look at it, it's a bunch of guys who, who do more traditional kinds of storytelling. And what I mean by that is, is that most of these guys are my age or younger, but we all grew up reading Jack Kirby and Stan Lee comics that, or, or, or some Superman and Batman comics that really excited us as kids. And what we've done is we've, we haven't come up with anything new. We haven't come up with a house style. We've gone back to tradi traditional storytelling uh, methods. Our biggest concentration is on trying to, uh, to get storytelling back to what it was uh, a few years ago, where the, the emphasis was on a, a writer and a penciler working together to, to come up with uh, a union that, that made sense, something that um, is greater than the sum of its parts. Well, I guess we're, tr we're doing our best to resist the common trend that you see out there uh, where the story's kind of pitched uh, by the side, where uh, pages are built just on one cool shot of a character and everything else is sort of secondary. And what we're trying to do is, is show that you can, you can uh, get by telling a story where um, the events in it matter, where there's some sort of a, of a progression with the character, and you know, everything isn't the same as it has been for the past 10 years. By definitely a clear, concise storytelling, and also, um, I think it, we, we, our stories are more character driven. We care more about our characters, and that's what drives the stories along. Once you develop the good characters, uh, the stories come rather easily. One of the things that I'm, I often say to my writers is, don't write me a comic book, write me a story. You know, um, the um, public's perception when some uses the term comic book or comic booky is a put down. You know, uh, comic books in, in my mind, let's, let's say, currently or in recent history are, are just really kind of cliche ridden things. I'm very interested in stories. Stories are, pe are people driven, character driven. You know, they're not situation driven. Um, I'm also looking to do what's not typical. I mean, I, I, I certainly don't want to alienate any, any people who like the opera pure. But at the same time, I really want to give them a twist on it. If we're going to write new operas, I want to do something different, not the same old thing. Our, our goal is to make it an entertainment company, not just a, a comic book company. I, uh, I see us with a, a series of successful films based on our characters. I see us uh, branching out and uh, the games and toys and uh, things of that nature. Um, I, I, I see this as, a, as a, a, an entity, something that uh, uh, will continue to grow and, and uh, branch out into areas that haven't been touched in terms of comics, media. That sort of thing. Our goals for Valiant is to be a media entertainment company. You know, we want to have, in five years, we want to have cartoons. I want to have adult cartoons. We want to have a nice toy line. We want to have video games. We want to have virtual reality. We want to have uh, uh, solar video parks. You know, we, we want to do everything. We want to be on the cutting edge of entertainment.